Well, North Korea now has missiles that could hit major U.S. cities. That's the warning from missile experts after the regime's latest test launch. Analysts say a missile from North Korea could possibly strike anywhere from Los Angeles to Chicago and possibly beyond. CNN international correspondent Alexander Field is live for us in Seoul, South Korea. Alex, the U.S. was quick to respond to this uh, with statements. Also, some military action we understand as well. What's happening? Hey there, Victor Christie. Good morning. Look, the South Koreans were quick to say that the launch of this ICBM did, in fact, represent an advancement in range. It was just a couple of weeks ago that we saw the first launch of an ICBM from North Korea. Experts had agreed at the time that that was a missile that could be capable of reaching Alaska. The latest news now with the latest launch being that this is a missile that could reach well farther into the U.S. mainland by some estimates, possibly as far as cities on the East Coast. So the South Korean and the U.S. military did not lose any time in responding to this. In the overnight hours here in South Korea, they conducted live fire exercises, even firing missiles into the ocean. This is a flexing of muscle, a show of force clearly intended to send a loud message to Pyongyang uh, in response to this highly provocative action. President Trump weighed in quickly, saying that the U.S. would take all steps necessary to protect the U.S. homeland, the American homeland. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson also quickly weighing in, singling out China and and Russia yet again calling them the principal economic enablers of a program that threatens not just regional but also global security. He went on to say this. He said the United States seeks the peaceful denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula and the end to belligerent action by North Korea. As we and others have made clear, we will never accept a nuclear armed North Korea nor abandon our commitment to our allies and partners in the region. Strong words, but that said, since President Donald Trump Trump took office back in January. Kim Jong-un has tested ballistic missiles on at least 12 occasions. This is a rapid acceleration of the program. In just six years that he has been in power, he has conducted more ballistic missile launches than his father or his grandfather combined. So threats and sanctions don't seem to be having any impact on the leader of that regime. While this test does certainly contribute to regional and global tensions, the response to the test are also ratcheting up tensions. Here in South Korea, President Moon Jae-in said he would be working with the U.S. to deploy more launchers on a highly controversial missile defense system that is operated and designed by the United States. This is a system that China and Russia have loudly objected to. China was also quick to respond in again registering its discontent with that, calling on both the U.S. and South Korea to stop the further deployment of this system. Christy, Victor. Mm, all right. Alexander Field, thank you so much for the update. After some uncertainty... North Korea claims it is making good on its threat to build a missile that can strike the United States. It says this missile tested on Friday can hit the whole U.S. mainland and should be considered a grave warning. The U.S. confirmed it was indeed an intercontinental ballistic missile, the second ever launched by Pyongyang. Just hours later, the U.S. staged a show of force with South Korea. U.S. President Donald Trump also sent a message to Pyongyang saying, quote, by threatening the world, these weapons and tests further isolate North Korea, weaken its economy and deprive its people. The United States will take all necessary steps to ensure the security of the American homeland and protect our allies in the region. So let's get to the region now. Journalist Kaori and Joji is in Tokyo monitoring developments. Uh, but let's start with Will Ripley, who's live in Beijing uh, for us. Will, there's a huge amount of pressure now on Beijing to do something, do anything to try to restrain uh, Pyongyang. You know North Korea well. You've spent a lot of time there. What, if anything, would work to change Kim's course? Well, uh, there's been a lot of pressure on Beijing for the last 20 years, certainly since their first nuclear test in the mid-2000s to try to s solve the North Korea issue, and uh, it hasn't worked. There have been five nuclear tests, dozens of missile launches under the current leader Kim Jong-un, 84, I believe, if our, if our counts are accurate, compared to uh, 15 and 16 for his father and grandfather, respectively. So uh, sanctions haven't worked. 
Uh, the North Korean economy grew by almost 4% last year, due in large part to trade with China and to a lesser extent Russia. And what China would really have to do to, to cripple the North Korean regime, if that would even work, and the North Koreans have told me as recently as last month it wouldn't, but China would have to cut off all trade, stop the flow of oil uh, from the pipeline that goes from China into North Korea, and essentially take actions that would be so severe they would almost have a destabilizing effect on the country, a country which, by the way, has gone through famine and many difficulties in the past, and the leadership has still kept its grip on power. And so what China is saying here in Beijing is that they believe, while they do condemn North Korea's actions, they think the United States and South Korea share the blame here through what they consider provocative behavior, like now bringing in more components, potentially, of the THAAD missile defense system. There was that live fire drill conducted just hours after the North Korean launch, where uh, the U.S. and South Korea were firing their own missiles into the ocean. All of those China considers provocative, destabilizing behavior. And so they apparently seem unwilling to take any further measures. They continue to trade. Billions of dollars continue to flow into Pyongyang from right here in China. Uh, and at this point, uh, there just doesn't seem to be a clear solution. Okay, let's find out about another regional state now. Kaori and Joji is in Tokyo for us. Kaori, this missile splashed down very near Japan. Are there concerns now that the recent regional overtures from the likes of South Korea to North Korea for some form of dialogue, that that has just fallen on deaf ears and that Japan in particular now needs to really boost its own defences? Well, Hannah, I think people are a lot more startled with this latest incident regarding uh, the missile launches than they have been in the past. And they've gone through so many missile launches and threats of more action in between. And I think there are a number of reasons for that. I mean, primarily, most of the Japanese people woke up to the news that the missile was launched while they were sleeping in the middle of the night and landed right off the coast of the northern island of Hokkaido. And I think the fact that the missile was launched on the day that the defense minister of Japan resigned due to a scandal, and there's only an interim defense minister at hand, I think raise the uh, level of alarm for Japanese citizens uh, right now. Um, the interim defense minister is wearing two hats now. He's also the foreign minister, and he was summoned to the uh, prime minister's residence uh, in the middle of the night. Uh, the prime minister, Shinzo Abe, saying that there's no alternative uh, but to increase the pressure because of what he calls this new level of threat. Here's what he had to say. As long as North Korea continues these provocations, the U.S., South Korea, China, and Russia, and the whole international community must closely cooperate and apply additional pressure. Okay. I mean, people I speak to today say they're a lot more concerned today than they have been in the past, particularly because the political situation is in flux. Um, and the prime minister is getting ready to reshuffle his cabinet. So for the next couple of days, there will be no permanent defense minister on deck. So I think there's going to be a lot more scrutiny on the prime minister as to whether or not he can put on a competent set of hands uh, to manage the situation at this very precarious time. And just to give you a sense of the mood here, uh, there's a civic portal site, a website that over the last couple of months has detailed fairly detailed steps as to what citizens should do in case of a missile attack. For example, get into a strong building, cover your mouth and so on and so forth. But, you know, at the start of this year and around March, um, there are only about 450,000 hits on that site per month. But lately, 450,000 people have been accessing that site per day. So I think although people are fairly calm still here, here in Japan, they're growing increasingly wary and watching a lot more carefully who the prime minister picks as his permanent defense secretary later on this week, Anna. Kaori and Joji in Tokyo and Will Ripley live for us in Beijing. My thanks to you both. Talk more about this now with Jasper Kim, the director of the Center for Conflict Management at Iwa University. He's also the founder of the Asia Pacific Global Research Group via Skype in Seoul, South Korea. It's good to have you with us this hour. Uh, so this latest video, I, I want to start with that, showcasing uh, this missile launch. It's highly produced. It's quickly turned around. What do you make of what you see? Well, I think we see something completely different, uh, George. We're entering a new normal, and specifically a new nuclear normal in Northeast Asia and the Korean Peninsula. We haven't seen North Korea, which is typically opaque, be so transparent. And with releasing all these images, plus the state-run announcement, um, and with these images, what's interesting is that it not only projects success, 
It also shows images of failure. And I think what it's trying to project is an air of authenticity because people might think and parse through all this and just say, well, it's merely North Korean propaganda, but it's trying to spell that notion and add a little bit of legitimacy to the regime. Taking a closer look at that missile, we, we just saw it there, and now we're looking at the nation's leader as he oversaw the launch. But again, uh, basically, Russia saying that this is not an intercontinental ballistic missile, the United States saying otherwise. When you see this missile, understanding the technological advances that North Koreans have made so far on the nuclear front, what, what do you take from it? Well, what I take away is not just one data point. I think we should be concerned as part of the international community, the arc, the trajectory of all these missile tests both successes and failures. And think of it like a startup in Silicon Valley, but here it's all of the DPRK. What its mission is, its product, if you will, is an ICBM and nuclear technology to put everyone on, a, on alert. And that's exactly what it's done. Whether the technology occurs today or tomorrow, I think the issue is clear. It's going to happen sooner than later. And I think the question then is not if, North Korea has nuclear weapons technology that can hit the U.S., but assume it does, now what? The United States making it clear that military options are on the table, certainly, but diplomatic efforts uh, are at the forefront of the efforts at this point. Um, sanctions, do sanctions matter at this point? Because what we see there is a nation that continues to develop despite the fact that these sanctions have existed for many years now. Well, George, one can argue that, in fact, sanctions might even propel more missile launches, more missile tests. It just gives more legitimacy within the DPRK amongst Kim Jong-un's people that it is a country that's being persecuted by the international community. Now, we know that's not really true, but the DPRK can spin that as such. So I think what the third way is, is and something that I've been arguing for months, and I wrote it in a Forbes op-ed, is that we really need a direct... Uh, have direct diplomacy with the highest levels of the DPRK. Obviously, sanctions aren't going to work. We've done rounds and rounds of that. Um, and what's the other extreme is outright war. We don't want any of that. So what we want is to just do something simple. Person to person is just talk. But for some reason, that's been conspicuously absent. Jasper Kim in Seoul, South Korea via Skype. Thank you so much for the time today. Thank you.